hello, Partnering for Vaccine Equity learning community members and others working on vaccine equity. And thanks for joining this afternoon's learning event. I'm Bridget Corteau. I'm the Director of Group Learning for our learning community. And we're all really excited about today's session where we'll hear about how storytelling can be a powerful tool for public health messaging, including ideas about how you can incorporate it into your work. Before we go further, I'm gonna do a very brief review of how the event works. You've been muted upon entry to the session and you can request to be unmuted if you'd like to speak a question during the Q&A session at the end. And you should use the raise hand feature to do that. You can also type a question for the speakers into the Q&A tab at any point during the session and we'll get to as many of these as we can at the end of the presentations. The chat room feature is also open today. We encourage you to use it. But if you have a question for the speakers, please put it into the Q&A so that we're sure to see it. We might miss it if you put it into the chat. We are uh, planning to offer live interpretation from English to Spanish during this event. Uh, our interpreter uh, is uh, on their way. So we actually don't have that Spanish channel set up yet. We're gonna start the presentations anyway because we have a very packed agenda. Um, and when the interpreter arrives and the Spanish channel is available and turned on, we will chat that to you um, so that you know uh, you're able to make that switch. There's a globe icon at the bottom. It will appear when we have Spanish interpretation available for you. And we'll chat that instruction again um, when that's available. Uh, finally, we'll make the slides and a recording of this event available to learning community members and to attendees after the fact. Our inbox, Equity Learning at urban.org, can always be used to contact us if you have technical difficulties during this session. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our fantastic lineup of speakers. Uh, since we have so much great content to cover today, I'm going to keep these very brief while one of my colleagues posts a link to a document with longer biographies that really do these speakers um, and their many accomplishments justice. So please check that document out when you see it in the chat. Dr. Zoan Clack, our keynote speaker, is a writer and executive producer on the award-winning ABC series, Grey's Anatomy. She's trained in emergency medicine and serves as a medical advisor to the show. And she's also a staunch advocate of promoting public health issues through the media. Dr. Erica Rosenthal is the Director of Research at the Norman Lear Center at the University of Southern California, where she oversees a portfolio of research focused on the content, audiences, and impact of media narratives on a wide range of health and social issues. Mr. Alexander Farhado is the Executive Director of El Sol Neighborhood Educational Center in San Bernardino, California, where he's an expert in implementing programs targeting individual, family, and community change using the community health worker model. And Mr. Jorge Perez is president and CEO of the YMCA of Greater Cincinnati, Ohio, where he's an accomplished strategic thinker, program innovator, fundraiser, and mission champion. Thank you all for taking the time to speak with us this afternoon. Dr. Clack, I'm gonna now hand the session over to you. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, as Bridget said, I am an executive producer on Grey's Anatomy. I have been there for uh, 17, I'm sorry, 18 seasons. Um, so I can no longer tell people I'm 30 when I've had one career as an emergency medicine physician and now 17 years on a show. So that's my bad. Uh, next slide. This is just a picture of the show in its infancy. Only about three of those uh, actors are still on the show, but we are still growing strong. Um, and we appreciate everyone who's watching. Next slide. So I was gonna talk to you about dramatic storytelling and how to engage the audience. Um, I am at Grays, we are very, very thoughtful as, about how we tell our stories since we realize a lot of people are getting at least some of their medical information and knowledge from television. Um, I just wanna emphasize how important truth is in storytelling. As I have here, storytelling is truth wrapped around a social experience. Great storytelling is being truthfully human. It's an honest expression of the human experience. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna go through in this, in this lecture, uh, three things that are so important to making a good story. Next slide. So you see stories, characters, and themes are highlighted here. Great stories communicate simple truths. Again, this word truth, authenticity, you'll hear that a lot in this lecture. Um, you should reflect dimensions of the human soul. Powerful characters help us understand our lives. 
Their stories reflect our core values as human beings and meaning, meaningful themes, which is something that I had to learn kind of on the fly as I was, um, as I had the job on Grey's Anatomy, as I had the job, um, themes are so important to help universalize the human experience and bring your storytelling together. It really helps the audience relate. And like I said, we're gonna really break down each of these categories and how they relate to telling a good story. Next slide. So let's start with story. I've highlighted some kind of terms that I'm gonna go into, but basically it is a series of acts that leads to a climax in which the protagonist and antagonist go head to head in a battle of win or loss that may or may not lead to a deep spiritual or moral change in the character. So the climax is the exciting part, what everything builds to. Let's say Miss Doubtfire, for example. It's when she has to do CPR on, her, on the boyfriend and it's, she's being exposed as, a, as the ex-husband and housekeeper. That's your climax, uh, example anyway. Um, protagonist and antagonist is basically your main character and their nemesis. Their nemesis could even be something like COVID. The battle of winner locks when our loss emphasizes the importance of conflict. It is very important to engage the audience and you know, not be dull. Um, this conflict can be an internal or an external struggle. It can be both. Um, and as I've written below this in the why now, uh, conflict is to story what sound is to music. It is that important. So the why now. This is the question that galvanizes the story and helps to explain why the audience should be invested in this moment, why they're here right now. Um, as I say, the inciting incident is there to try to restore balance. And what the inciting incident is, it's the moment in which the character starts their journey, the jolt that gets the ball rolling to where, how you're gonna tell this story and in what context at this moment. Um, and as I say, stakes as well as conflict are very important and stakes are why reality can be so important. If you don't have boundaries, you lack state, stakes and anything can happen if there's no repercussions. If it's a fictional world that you're making up, you'll notice that they have always set up rules. For instance, you never feed a gremlin after midnight. Consequences. Uh, next slide. So story building, um, here we are with the truth again, the truth of the world wrapped up into an emotional experience. It should be honest and relatable. And this emotional experience is another big thing. On Grey's, what we write is fiction, but what we tell is truth. And that is true of much of TV and film. This is part of what compelling storytelling is all about. Storytelling is taking the truth of the world, wrapping it into an emotional, honest experience that the audience can relate to. Your stories should help illuminate the human condition. Good stories inspire and engage emotion as well as intellect. Laughing, crying, hating. We often get notes after, not often, but every once in a while you'll get a note after writing a script really quickly or something. And it's like, I didn't laugh or cry. I need to laugh or cry. That's like part of the experience of making the story work. And of course, an emotional reaction leads people to think about themselves and their own attitudes. And for communication strategies, which you were all doing, this means that highly emotional messages are more readily accepted by audience members and more likely lead to behavioral change than messages that are low in emotional content. Um, and like I said, they should compel interest. Um, they should have the rhythm of life, variety, uh, it shouldn't be very kind of same, same. They should have peaks and valleys. Uh, nobody wants to be completely stressed the entire time that they're, that they're watching, but also you don't want them to be so blase that they just want to turn it off. So it's that nice balance of um, the rising tension and kind of the rests in between. Um, and of course you take out the mundane and the banal of everyday life because who wants to see doctors writing notes? We know that doctors write notes all the time. And we have a lot of people who are like, in real life, that's what we do. Uh, this is not real life. This is real life magnified and compelling. Um, and again, authenticity, we're back with the truth. Uh, internal consistency, the, the story should be true to itself and not kind of go all over the place. And the 
because the audience will deeply believe in the world that you have created and want to want to be taken on the journey with you. You want them to go on that journey. And I didn't mention the reverse expectations. You know, you, you don't want them to just see what they already expect. You want to turn turn the tides, kind of like Sixth Sense when um, the guy was dead the whole time. You had to rethink your entire experience of the story. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is a story of Bailey's mom dying of COVID, which we did in season 17. And again, this is kind of the epitome of what I've, what I've been talking about, kind of putting all these things together. Um, it was the authenticity comes with it being based on my own mother, although she didn't die. Um, but the conflict of being alone, being one among many, wait, wanting to do more and feeling helpless. Um, you can go ahead and play the clip. Be exposed. I know this is not what you imagined for your mother, and I'm sorry about that. But she needs you now. It's time. And if you don't go in, I promise you will never forgive yourself. I'm scared. I've got sunshine. I know. We'll do it together. Patients lose their power when they are referred to as bed number four or arm pain guy. Even in their deaths, they are not faceless. They are not nameless. They are more than statistics. More than comorbid conditions or nursing home patients. They are sons, brothers, and uncles who speak five languages and run restaurants. Wade Klein, 66. They are great grandfathers who love Broadway. Jacob Lappin, 92. I don't need no money, fortune, or fame. I got. They are baseball-loving nurses with an easy laugh. Dane Wilson, 45. I get you say what can make me feel this way, my girl. Talking about my girl. Okay. They are the world's greatest mothers, and they are the most beloved wives. Elena Rose Bailey, 84. I'm sorry, I know it's poor form to like cry at your own writing, but um, the way she presents that, it gets me every single freaking time. Um, so yes, this was based on emotions that everyone was going through, um, happening to a character that is well-loved and cherished over 17 seasons at the time of Grey's and therefore I think was pretty effective in getting kind of that message across. So going to, uh, the next step in storytelling, avoiding exposition. This is really important, I think, for especially public health and entertainment ed education. Um, I know you have to start with the issues, but the issues should come out of story. It shouldn't be the thing. Like, for instance, we had um, a sponsored week for um, breast cancer back in season three, and we did a story about a woman who had breast cancer after having her baby and blamed her baby. So we figured out at the end that she was resisting everything because she, or she didn't want to see her baby because she blamed her because she thought it was a clogged milk duct, which caused her to be um, diagnosed later. So you see, there's a lot of issues in there, but a lot of story um, that got us there. So you want to dramatize the facts, try to make it virtually invisible that, you know, you're teaching them about delayed breast cancer and, and young people. That was what that story was. Um, 
you keep the audience curious, asking questions, letting them in on a need to know basis, giving them information, parsing it out as you, as you show and don't tell and tell your story. Use all of these times as teachable moments. All right, next slide. Let's get to character. Uh, so a character is any entity that is capable of making a rational decision. It has willpower, which means that they can face the conflict and they have the will to keep facing the challenges. It has desire. There is something that that character wants, which might conflict with what they need, which is the second thing, I mean, the third thing. And they must actually possess the skill to pursue the goal, which is capacity. Uh, character is the distilled essence of a human being. That's again, truth, authenticity. Um, but everything is condensed. For instance, some of our characters, you may have noticed, have way too many specialties. Uh, our neurosurgeons, our neurologists, neurosurgeons, interventional radiologists, internists, they do a lot of things. And why is that? We don't want to tell a story about a bunch of different characters. We want the character that the people know and love. Um, we condense all their specialties so that we can get good cases, we can get good story, and tell it through the characters that we know. Um, heightened. When we talk to experts and they say, oh, well, that would be rare. It'd be kind of a one in a million. We're like, that's the story we want. It's heightened. It's not your everyday story. And even if it is your everyday story, like we've done diabetes, it's that time when his foot needs to be cut off. You know, it's, it's not the mundane, as I said before. Um, it's accelerated. You may notice that our patients sometimes wake up way earlier than they would in real life. We need to condense and tell the story. Um, also being flawed as a character is super important. It makes the character more related, relatable. It makes the audience more empathetic towards your characters and it makes them more human, which is of course the most important. Next slide. So character is a metaphor for humanity. The best place to find them is in your own experiences. Um, the audience experienced character as if they were the character themselves. You, you may have noticed that there are a lot of uh, which character are you kind of quizzes on BuzzFeed and the internet. And that's because people relate so much to them, which always brings me back to Bandura's social learning theory because you know I do have a degree in public health and um, it just amazes me. And this whole thing validates my experience uh, of being a doctor and not actually physically saving lives, but literally reaching out to millions of people around the world. Um, Yes, because people relate to characters, they see how the characters in a drama solve problems and that gives the audience uh, the motivation to try and engage and because they identify so, so much with these characters. Um, we're gonna show another clip uh, where Bailey is in another COVID scenario where her character is put to a test. Hi, mom. Mask up, Mr. Anderson. Sir, I forgot the whole coronavirus. Sir, I need you to listen to me. Your COVID test came back positive. Additionally, you have ground glass opacities in your lungs. That's why you're having trouble breathing. And your toes aren't red because you run without socks. You have what's being referred to as COVID toe. COVID toe? Yes. Really, this is the best you got? Go up a toe? Are you guys even trying? This ultrasound of your leg reveals a clot that we need to treat immediately. So... Okay, well, whose leg is that? I'm sorry? Well, see, I'm a, I'm a runner. We don't get blood clots, but it's a... That's a, that's a nice try, though. Mr. Anderson, okay. please. You know what? I figured out... Huh? I figured out that it's a little cold that y'all are so terrified of. Biggest money maker since cryptocurrency. Speaking of, how, how do you get your kickbacks? I mean, is it like a flat fee from every patient that you diagnose, or is it like a, a percentage deal, or...? My... Um... Uh, be back in a moment. I need to answer a page. Yeah, yeah, take your time. What? What? Okay. Breathe, breathe, breathe. What? Stop. Hey, let's try this. Your blood oxygen 
is dangerously low. Your lungs are getting worse, and if untreated, the clot in your leg could travel to your lungs and kill you. We're seeing cases like yours all of the time. Sir, this is not just a cold. It's not asthma. This won't magically go away. Sir, please, let us admit you so that we can start you on steroids and, and put you on blood thinners. Look, because even if you are a little bit wrong, it could be fatal. You know, I'm still waiting on that albuterol prescription, Doc. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, that guy dies. <laughs> but you can see how the facts are presented dramatically and don't feel like exposition. So just getting into quickly what is theme is so, so, so important. Um, it is, Arthur Miller said, when I figure out what the story is about, I make sure every scene has to do with that. This is the, the discovery of truth, your discovery of the meaning of your work. Uh, this deepens it, it makes it more powerful, more accessible, that it emerges the truth through the storytelling. Um, theme is just an expression of a universal truth about the human condition. It should be emotional, compelling, and make the stories viscerally engaging and bring your stories together. Um, they provide a central and unifying concept that drives the story, drives choices, and guides the characters' actions, and vice versa. Next slide. Here's some examples of Gray's themes. I think the, the, the one that's the most obvious is we had a theme that was too much of a good thing. There was priaprism, which was an erection for too long, hyponatremia, which was from too much water, uh, and a woman with three kids who was having quintuplets. So that's an example of how the theme brought everything together and made it a cohesive story. Um, but what theme is not, next slide, is uh, the moral of the story. And I think for public health, this is very important. We don't want to just sit and give them facts. Um, Orson Welles said, judge not yes, lest ye bore the audience. Uh, try to avoid easily solving a problem. You want you want conflict, you want stakes. Um, the goal is to have the audience learn without knowing that they have learned. Um, a good example of this is Gray's, uh, that was work, we were actually working with an issue first from the Kaiser Family Foundation that we were putting into an episode in season four. And the theme was, the theme of the episode was giving birth to greatness. Izzy had, was just a, a, a new second year um, resident. She was with new interns who weren't respecting her. She had this new power, but nothing was going the way she planned it. And then she decided to take back her power and she wasn't gonna let people walk, walk over her anymore. The issue that we were de dealing with was HIV transmission to newborns. Next slide and clip. If you wanna have an abortion because you think that's what medicine is telling you to do, then that's between you and me. I was ineffectual. It was unclear. I've been on my heels a little bit lately and I was unclear, so just listen, okay? I wasn't telling you there is some chance your baby might not be born sick. I was telling you there is a 98% chance your baby could be born perfectly healthy. A 98% chance. There's a higher chance of your baby being born with Down syndrome than there is of you passing HIV onto your child. I don't, I just, I, I can't. I know you gave up about having children a long time ago and I understand that it's difficult to readjust your thinking so quickly, but Sarah, if you take your meds responsibly, there's no reason why you can't have a beautiful, healthy baby. This is your chance, if you want it. This is your chance to be a mom. A 98% chance. 98% chance. Okay. Since we're going over, I'm going to make this my last slide. I just basically want to say that our process should, is the same as anyone's process. The story or the case should reflect the personal journey of the characters. I'm not going to, you, you shouldn't throw out a lot of facts unless it's dramatized in some way and make it accessible to your audience we, so that they can relate to the characters. People identify with your characters, care about your characters. 
and um, make the circumstances common to the audience's experience so they can relate and learn. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clack. <laughs> I'm sorry to, to cut you a little short. Um, that was so awesome. Uh, if those of you who did not see this in the chat, Spanish interpretation is now available. The channel is working. Um, so check it out if you would like that service. And I'm going to uh, toss it to Dr. Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Bridget. I'm excited to be here with you today. At the Norman Lear Center, we study and shape the impact of media and entertainment on society. Our Hollywood Health and Society program, for which Dr. Clack is a longtime collaborator and board member, works with the entertainment industry to inspire accurate and nuanced storylines. At the Center's Media Impact Project, we study the content, audiences, and impact of stories in media, including entertainment, journalism, and more. But to truly understand the impact of storytelling, we first need to understand the science, how and why are stories so powerful? Next slide, please. We're constantly bombarded with messages from different sources, all competing for our limited attention. Stories are persuasive precisely because of their ability to break through the clutter and make us pay attention. They do this through various psychological processes. When we identify with a character, we're more likely to follow their lead. Contrary to popular belief, this doesn't require that we look like that character. Parasocial interaction is a type of identification in which we experience feelings of friendship with fictional characters or celebrities. This can function almost like a real life relationship. Transportation is when we become so immersed in the story world that we lose track of our surroundings and essentially become one with the story. Different emotions have different effects, but in general, emotion heightens the effects of transportation. Altogether, these processes help stories overcome the resistance or pushback that we tend to experience to more overt persuasive messages. As a result, stories can fly under the radar and influence us even without our conscious awareness. Mass media entertainment has both massive emotional power and massive reach. But storytelling doesn't require access to the entertainment industry or a huge budget. Communicators and others seeking to promote public health can take a page from this playbook and harness the power of storytelling. So next, I'll share some examples on the power of story from our research on entertainment. Next slide, please. We studied a 2015 storyline on the USA series Royal Pains involving a transgender teen character which aired around the same time as Caitlyn Jenner's transition. Those who saw this brief storyline had more supportive attitudes toward transgender people and relevant policies. Interestingly, there was no effect of exposure to transgender news stories, including the Caitlyn Jenner story. Those who felt hopeful while watching the storyline had more supportive attitudes. And in addition, we found that the more shows with transgender characters people saw, the more supportive their attitudes. And this was particularly true among more conservative audiences. Next slide, please. Another example. With support from Define American, we studied the impact of three immigration storylines from uh, the 2018 to 2019 TV season. One of these from the NBC series Superstore involved Mateo a regular character who's an undocumented immigrant. In this clip, his coworkers try to protect him from an ICE raid. Let's play the clip. I mean ICE, immigration, they're coming right now. Oh my gosh, you have to leave. Oh my gosh. Wait, what, you knew? Why didn't you tell me? It's not my secret, it's Mateo's secret. You told Jonah? I thought that was between us. You told Marcus too? Wait, did you tell him before you told me? You shouldn't tell so many people. Is there anybody else you didn't tell or just me? Hey guys. Oh my God. Oh my God. I gotta go. Okay. It's okay. It's over. Next slide, please. We found that viewers who experienced these parasocial relationships, feelings of friendship, with Mateo 
were more likely to support inclusive immigration policies. But this was particularly true for viewers who had little or no real life contact with immigrants. So this suggests that attachments to regular characters can actually fill in somewhat for the absence of relationships with members of marginalized communities and contribute to a reduction in prejudice. Next slide. Our Hollywood Health and Society program has inspired media narratives through partnerships with the creative community for over 20 years. To promote COVID vaccination in LA County, they developed English and Spanish language PSAs for Vaccinate LA. The Spanish language version began airing on Univision's two local stations in early January and will run through March. We hope to have some data soon on the impact of these PSAs, but let's take a look. Slide, please. In 2019, Zainab Tufeki published a piece in Scientific American about the differences between what she calls sociological and psychological storytelling. We found across a number of different topics in our research that dominant media narratives tend to be psychological. They emphasize individual explanations and personal responsibility but sociological stories that balance individual and structural factors and also model systemic solutions to these challenges tend to be more effective at inspiring social change. This is really the essence of the challenge for storytellers who seek to change the narrative around inequities in health. How can we make stories about systems and institutions emotionally compelling? Next slide. I'd like to thank the team at the Norman Lear Center, as well as our funders and partners who make this work possible. And now back to you, Bridget. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosenthal, for that great presentation. And uh, without any further ado, I'm going to toss it now to Mr. Farhado. Welcome, and uh, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Bridget. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, hi, everyone. Happy to be here. Yes, our, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, we are a nonprofit organization serving San Bernardino and Riverside counties, California. <clears throat> um, and we have implementing a lot of uh, work in COVID-19. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, we use community health workers uh, as part of our strategies. Everything we do is with community health workers. Uh, the next slide shows uh, who are the community her workers uh, they are people from the community they have the trust uh, we uh, inform and empower community members to make changes in their lives we connect to to resources <clears throat> and um and then i think i think that's that's important for to give you the foundation what we have been developing in in, in regards to the COVID. i think you can go to the next slide please in the in the COVID nineteen approach, we have been doing a training to CHWs or outreach in how to uh, do the work in the community. We have been doing a lot of work in education, uh, linkage and resources to the community, and and helping and actually facilitating testing, vaccinations too. And right now we are moving towards uh, the recovery phase, so we are developing kind of um, a new phase on how to recover. Um, from um, from COVID. Uh, next slide, please. In regards to the outreach, we have been doing a lot of uh, uh, health first. Most of the CHWs, promotores, they do a lot of health first, door to door. They put tables in market in supermarkets. Um, in our case, we provide kids, uh, care kids, and outreach uh, 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 kids to support our community. But after talking with our team, we have been thinking how we can really uh, change or, or do more 
uh, regarding, regarding educating our community in a COVID-19. So we get together with all of our community health workers and uh, start developing new strategies, how we can reach our community. And we came up with a few ideas that we are gonna share today uh, in regards of our, or, of our story. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so one of the things that we start developing what was the puppet shows. Uh, so we create kind of, um, that was back in uh, when at the beginning of the pandemic. So we were developing, okay, how we can really reach our communities and they developed the puppets. Uh, it was very good. It was uh, uh, a few chapters, like uh, 10 chapters with different topics like face, uh, contact tracing, very, very powerful uh, uh, strategy. Um, uh, they have uh, kids that are going to school. Uh, it was super, super, super great. Actually, it's, it's, it's still uh, uh, in place. We are going to schools doing the puppets as part of the strategy for education. Next slide, please. The next one, uh, we develop a superhero, which his name is Captain Empat or Capitan Corazon. Uh, he's a promoter, he's a community, a community health worker and you can see him in the, in the corner. And we develop like comic strips uh, uh, from the community. So we, we went to the community and start having, and some of the characters, I, I will say most of the characters that, that we have in the comic strips are from the community. So we interview them, we say, okay, can you be part of this? And we develop uh, an activity book, we develop posters, uh, we have a lot of importance of the COVID uh, vaccination and mental health. Next slide, you can see some of them. Um, so we create like this. This is like little cartoons. Instead to create like a long um, flagger with a lot of information, we create like a little history stories from the community. And this, this is in Spanish, but we have in English too. Um, and, and for example, uh, the, the woman in, 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 on our left, She's a promotora, but she's a community health worker, and she's part of the uh, of the of the work. And she was who developed kind of the story behind of this. Uh, so it was a powerful uh, opportunity to change and how to reach the community as they go to the to the work in in, in the community. Next slide, please. Um, we also we came to the uh, uh, along 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 that we were developing kind of these uh, comic strips and and how we're gonna be approaching the community, we develop like a play uh, that we are performing. This is a community theater uh, that we are going to, to each of the, of the school, whatever they call us. Uh, so we have there the Captain Impact, which is a promoter, and he's also in the, in the comics. And we did, um, and we have a Corona uh, there, <laughs> and they, they have, uh, we developed like the play. Can you, can you go next slide and maybe you can play a little bit of the of the play, uh, and you can yeah. In 2019, a new virus arrived on Earth. It was more contagious and deadly than ever expected. It soon began to spread all around the world. To stop the spread and protect the people, all non-essential activities were shut down. Gyms, schools, parks, and theaters were all closed down as large gatherings were no longer allowed. Luckily, our superheroes, as some have come to call them, from El Sol, came to the rescue. Yeah, that you can, and, and, I mean, say, say minutes, but that's, it was, has been so powerful. Uh, another opportunity, but I, and then everything aligns with the scripts, with the with the um, what we create. So it's, it's super super helpful. Uh, next next slide, uh, we develop music songs. In this case, this music song it was community health workers from the African American and Latino getting together, and this is time to heal. Can you play a little bit too? And then I will share the the link which you can find. Time to live, time to live, time to heal, time to move yeah. on, 
that's, that's another one. And we create the next one yeah, in, in order to, and we create this one. That was the, the first one that we created. That was the time to heal for uh, um, in Spanish. Uh, it is super powerful. And we create like a little, a little uh, kid. He's, he's, he's a, a 10, 10 years old and he was our, our character. Can you play it a little bit? Um. <laughs> Yo me sentía bien enfermo con tos y cansancio y temperatura Pensé será el COVID, el coronavirus Me hice la prueba para salir de dudas Decidí quedarme en casa, pues si sí voy al jale Contagio la raza, si tú andas en... So this, 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 um, the time to heal and this song We create like a, like a toolkit as well so people, in this case, we create like 30 seconds. So we were playing in radio. And then actually I was in, a, in one of the uh, time um, in, a, in, a, in a room and then they were playing this song and saying, hey, this is ours. So uh, that's kind of uh, um, uh, the opportunities to change how we uh, 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 approach our community. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's what we have. I think next slide shows, uh, yeah, I mean, we have done, we have been doing games as well. We have the Loteria or Bingo with the COVID-19. So when we go to the community, we go like like a bingo. Uh, instead to give like a giveaways, we develop kind of a bingo Loteria. And also we have like, um, when we are in tables, they play and they give something, everything, everything related to COVID-19. So I think, I think, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna pass to, to Brittany and thank you so much for, for and listening. Thank you, Mr. Farhado. Uh, those are very inspiring examples. Uh, and we have uh, some more coming now. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Perez uh, to hear about another community based organization's approach to incorporating storytelling. Yeah, I'm actually going to go ahead and get right into a quick video and then I'll speak to that. Uh, to my what family we is my number one priority and protecting them is key. Hello, my name is Felicia Beckham and I'm a board certified family nurse practitioner. Family is a foundation and having them around is very important to thrive, to love, to survive. I selected to take the Johnson & Johnson idea, take the Pfizer. If I could be first in line, I wouldn't have been. I was a little bit hesitant. As a black man, one of our hesitancies is to visit doctors. I feel as though in the African-American community that the healthcare system has not been favorable for us. With getting some knowledge from my daughter, uh, Felicia, in regards to um, the effectiveness of the shot. So for me, I had to do some research and that meant going to my niece who is a nurse practitioner, listening to podcasts, understanding what Dr. Fauci said. I seen an importance for me to not only protect me, but to protect my family, which is my purpose in living. Understand that COVID affects everyone, not only the person that's affected, but everyone around you. Understand that COVID can take a toll long-term on someone's health, but also death is still on the table. Understand that we have to get ahead of it and prevention is key. The vaccine is the key to the prevention. Not another family member, not another death. So we've been hearing a lot about the power of storytelling and what I hope to accomplish in uh, our uh, segment is to give you a little formula that you can use to create your own stories. You can tell that the video that we created here in the Cincinnati area, we could have just had the nurse practitioner speak about uh, COVID, but like so many of the other presenters, telling the story is important. We actually specifically asked that we do the video in her living room at her home because we felt like her message would communicate so much more if you saw the rest of her family around her. This is the formula we use when we create the scripts or the videos that we use here in Cincinnati. We want a hook. Uh, that's something that we engage people real quickly. You notice how that took place really, really early on. 
We want to make sure there's a little bit of an educational uh, part to it. Uh, we go deeper. This is where the family members were talking a little bit. And then we do ask people to take action to get vaccinated. Um, we use this formula when we give speeches, when we do one minute video presentations, or we, when we do it a little longer. Is we just have found this formula to be significantly better. Next slide, please. Uh, part of that formula then uh, feeds this idea. And you've been hearing this idea of the hero story of the characters in the videos you heard, you saw the previous presenter actually had a superhero. Uh, the idea here is to create uh, a point of contact for the people that are watching these stories. And so we want to ask the question, what does the hero want? And the hero in our story wanted uh, her family to be safe. And uh, we wanted to embrace the conflict. You notice how uh, there was a little bit of a conflict in the families. We didn't cut that part of the story out because we felt it was important to leave that because those are real questions people have. And then we want to make sure that there's clear clarity around what uh, we expect the individual who's watching the video to actually complete that. So if you're wondering, next slide, whether you should be doing this as part of your work, the answer is yes. The fact of the matter is that uh, we don't have a big production company. We don't have a whole lot of dollars to spend at this. Uh, in some cases, we use the cameras we have and uh, a few hundred dollars with the, some microphones, and then we just let individuals speak. These are the other things that we uh, take, take uh, in consideration, make sure that the sound and the lighting is strong and effective. We try to make sure that we show more and tell less. No one wants to hear another lecture, although I'm lecturing to you right now. Uh, the hook, book, look, took formula uh, can be used to inspire. We try not to script the speakers. We did not ask the nurse to say certain things. We just asked her questions and recorded her responses. Same with the family members. And then the trick is to stay close to the message. Now, why is the YMCA involved in all of this? Next slide. Uh, it's because the YMCA is about engaging uh, in the community. We want to, our focus is on uh, healthy living. You can go ahead and click through the three other pictures there. Um, we're engaged in trying to make sure that we uh, partner with other agencies. The nurse does not work for us. We, were, we work with the health collaboratives in our areas. We do on a number of events uh, in the community, including some vaccine clinics and whatnot. And then we want to make sure that we uh, measure the impact that we have on the lives of people, uh, whether it's how we distribute the videos and how we use social media to do that, or we uh, look at the number of people that are actually uh, viewing uh, and, con and, and consuming that, and whether behavior has been changed. That's the power of stories, and you've been hearing that throughout this entire presentation, that when you connect people at the story level, you move them much further than if you just simply tell them this is what they should do. And that's why we use stories at the YMCA. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Wow. <laughs> this is uh, so much wonderful content. Uh, and we do have, uh, even with fitting all of that in, uh, several minutes left for questions and answers. So I'm going to remind all of you that if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A right now. Um, but I'll get started with a question that feels appropriate for all of you. Um, some are coming in for, for specific speakers. We'll get to those too if we can. Um, but for any of the speakers, uh, uh, one question is that it seems there's magic and secret sauce to storytelling. How do you evoke emotion in your audience, making them laugh or cry or whatever you're going for? So what would be one or two tips to keep in mind uh, how to evoke these emotions that you're looking for? I, I, can, I can jump in. I think as a nonprofit, you know, sometimes we don't have the funding to hire um, spend. It's, it's talking about our, our, our realities in our community and from the heart. That's, I mean, that's what we do. It's not really like investing too much. We didn't have a study to do kind of what is the best approach. It was something that came out is the, from the community uh, and from the heart. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to echo exactly the same thing. Um, the, the way you connect with people 
um, is going to be through the heart. All of the videos we've watched throughout this presentation uh, had some very emotional moments in them that then carried the, the, the knowledge, the information that we want to carry. And it sticks better when we do that. And so we look for uh, opportunities to kind of really uh, strum in and connect with people at the heart level. Right, I would add <clears throat> just the thing that was through my whole talk, truth and authenticity. Just being able to tell the human experience and make it relatable to your audience and um, pull it all together so that there's heartstrings, there's laughter, you wanna take them on a journey and want them to go on that journey with you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and it does appear that we have um, an audience member who would like to speak their question. Kim, I saw your hand raised early on. Kim Wadstrill, uh, would you like to speak your question? Nope. No longer see the hand up. So we'll move on to another question. For those of you who have worked with artists um, to create your storytelling uh, products, um, how do you approach those artists? Uh, are you compensating them? I think some of this was addressed in the presentations, um, but anything additional on kind of uh, approaching folks that you wanna work with um, and getting them on board? I think in, my, in, in our end group, because we have one uh, one person actually in the in the video for um, for the time to heal. Uh, yes, we approached, but it was about really a friend that we know that have a person. So it's, it's really like, hey, can you help us? Um, yeah, that's that was pretty much. And definitely, some most of them they didn't charge. Um, yeah, actually, he didn't charge. So use your connections. And I think Mr. Perez, you had also said that, that the why also used some connections they had in the community to associations and, and um, provider organizations. Yeah, I mean, there's something to be said about hiring talent. There are a few times where we do that when we're telling a particular story. And we usually work with some of the um, uh, organizations in the area, including the School for Performing Arts or some of the university students. But for the most part, the best heart stories um, are just the ones, as Alex spoke about, the ones where people are just telling their story. Mm -hmm. uh, we could not have paid that family to tell what they said, uh, to say it in the way they said it. It's just, that was, they were just simply sharing what their experience was. Yeah, it was very powerful. Um, are there any particular strategies to help avoid alienating people who may not be supportive of the public health initiatives and storytelling? Is that something that you're keeping in mind? Um, and what strategies do you have? I think that's one of the powers of storytelling, especially if they're telling their story. You're just simply giving them a voice. Um, it's not about trying to push a specific agenda. Um, one of the family members had some reservations about the vaccine and we allowed that to kind of float into the space um and we know that there's some controversy about stuff like that but how, how do you fight back against somebody's personal individual story i'm of the ilk that if you tell a, a store a good story and the person is drawn in they may learn without knowing they, they're learning so they're just watching the drama and you're not really concerned about you know whether or not you're going to transform them or turn their lives but if they are into the story it'll kind of get into their heads and hopefully you know through just more and more exposure to it they may make a change This is something that I think could be on the minds of many uh, of our learning community and audience members. So we are rounding year two of the pandemic and fatigue is set in for many. Messaging could become redundant. So any insights from any of the speakers on how to keep messages fresh and attention capturing? I just I just want to mention some, especially for example, for the cap, the superhero and the play, uh, we were uh, doing, we were invited by a, a school district to play the performance, the play, and um, and then the, the 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 leadership from the school after they did the vaccination because we did the vaccination like 
two weeks after. After the play, a lot of people start coming, ah, you know what, let's do it. This is, it was so fun that people really get to like, um, I, want, I want to get vaccinated. So uh, we were able to vaccine 300 kids. Uh, uh, teens in the in the school, so I think it's another way to prom to promote it and to engage. They were taking pictures with the superhero. They was posting in in their um, TikTok things like that, and they get engaged with this kind of relationship and say, "Hey, you're gonna get vaccinated?" Yes, yes. And then it was kind of a momentum that that was a powerful moment. So I think it's another another aspect in how to engage community members uh, to reflect on on on, on these issues. Thank you. We have just a couple minutes left. Um, and uh, we have a satisfaction poll. So we want to make sure before we start losing folks, uh, many of you may have additional meetings to get to. Um, if you wouldn't mind taking a second to answer this uh, satisfaction poll, we'd really appreciate it. Um, it helps us with our uh, future planning. Um, and I think just as one um, kind of final uh, question for any of our speakers, um, you know, if you have uh, if if you have an audience member who's sort of starting from scratch, the storytelling is sort of completely new uh, for them. Um, you know, where would you suggest that they start in terms of brainstorming um, how to incorporate uh, storytelling into their activities? What would be kind of one easy first step that they might do? For me, I would look around, <laughs> look around at your friends, your family, your stories, um, get your, your, use those as your characters, um, look at situations that you find interesting and dramatize them, um, bring it in from your own personal experience and you will find that other people have similar experiences. Yeah, I, I was going to say the same, but I think also, don't limit because you don't have because some of the things we we think this is we need we need have to have this much money to do this don't limit yourself about resources i think if you launch your vision the resources will come and then believe me people really engage with that vision yeah i mean we're saying i think we're hearing the same thing from the group, uh, start by telling the stories that are already there uh, with your staff, with your participants. Um, it's extraordinary sometimes what you find and what people are willing to share. And if you're wanting to learn how to do that, uh, take a look at the story platforms right now that exist. Uh, we pick up a lot of ideas on YouTube and TikTok and everywhere else. Um, and, and uh, ask ourselves, how could we use that formula, that process, uh, that hero story to tell what we want to tell? Um, and so again, I don't think it's super complicated. And uh, if I could just add, uh, look to your younger staff. Uh, they tend to have no challenge uh, telling their stories. Um, they're doing it all the time right now. Awesome. I would so add, uh, think about how you might be able to tell stories about solutions, particularly systemic or collective solutions that involve community members coming together rather than the kind of individual hero narratives that, that we often see in media. Very good advice. So you might not have to look very far. Um, think about uh, sort of collective stories and there are resources out there. Uh, and speaking of resources, uh, just another um, reminder that we will be sharing the slides, the recording from this event um, to the extent there were video links or other resources mentioned during this presentation, uh, we will uh, compile those and include them with the materials. Uh, but a big thank you to all of our wonderful speakers. Um, we fit so much into the hour. Uh, we could have gone on, I think, for at least two more. So uh, we really appreciate it on behalf of the Partnering for Vaccine Equity Learning Community. Uh, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.